All right, you made it for video three. That's a good sign. So in this video, we'll be talking about the interphalangeal or IP joints of the fingers, and we'll also go over some hand and finger deformities uh, that you might see. Uh, so, you know, most fingers, uh, except the thumb, has this proximal and distal IP joint, uh, and then you have a phalanx and the base of the phalanx distal to it. Uh, so each IP joint does have a joint capsule, a volar plate, and you can see the volar plate right there. And then it has a collateral ligament on this side. And if we were to flip this over, you'd see a collateral ligament on the other side. So uh, essentially, there are two collateral ligaments for each finger. And it's named on which side it is. So there's an ulnar collateral ligament and a radial collateral ligament or a medial and lateral um, collateral ligament. Using the terms the ulnar and radial is uh, sometimes easier um, when when dealing with the fingers and you can imagine the forces that they would prevent there. So with the extrinsic finger flexors they have attachments above or proximal to the RC joint. Uh, I got a little crazy with my highlight. I went a little high there. Sorry about that. Uh, but we have uh, two extrinsic uh, muscles. You have your flexor digitorum superficialis, and then you have your flexor digitorum uh, profundus. And obviously, we know that the flexor digitorum superficialis, or the FDS, flexes the proximal IP joint. Uh, it also contributes to MCP joint flexion as both. Uh, flexors do. Um, but with this, the profundus is going to also get the distal IP joints. And so that that's what makes it special. Uh, so these are your extrinsic finger flexors. So let's talk about uh, the mechanisms of this. Uh, what's interesting uh, about this is that you can see uh, the blue so all this blue on the slide here represents all the bursas. So it's a nice little appreciation for all the bursas, which are meant to uh, decrease friction within the area. So you can see all the blue there. Uh, so that's looking to decrease friction, which is usually abbreviated FR, capital F, lowercase r. And so you can see there's your camper's chasm, and it's right there. Uh, and, but you can see the tendons as they travel through. And with this, one thing you want to look at are these annular pulleys. And you can see the different uh, zones. So you can see A1, A2, A3, and you can see all these different zones. On the, on the fingers, or I should say digits 2 through 5, you can see you have those pulleys that extend uh, throughout. So those, those five are there. Whereas on the thumb, on the first digit, you only have that A2 as the final uh, pulley. So there aren't as many pulleys on the thumb as on the other ones. Uh, but you can see those are your annular pulleys by A's. Uh, and then I'll get a different color for this. You have your cruciate pulleys as well. And those are represented. Uh, no surprise with the letter C. So you can see how those contribute. Uh, and when you see cruciate, you're probably thinking X. So X or crisscross. So when you talk about the cruciate ligaments at the knee, anterior and posterior cruciate, they do form a crisscross or cross. Uh, so you have your cruciate ligaments, whereas your, ant your collateral ligaments are more parallel on each aspect of the joint. Uh, so there you go with this information. Obviously, any interruption in either the annular pulleys or the distal tendon sheaths can result in a significant loss of muscle strength. So to show you that, there's a picture of a fishing rod. And so if you look at this, so you can see these would be where the annular pulleys would be represented. And ultimately, that's going to make that line uh, travel through a further distance and at each point it's creating a force back to the rod each pulley's there and so that overall force is combined and it contributes to the 
tensile strength that the rod would have on, uh, in this case, the fish. I will draw a little fish. You can leave comments if you like my, my fish. Oh, a fish has to have eyes and a mouth. And it's a little happy fish. So, so there you go. Uh, I know you may be looking at other online lectures and you're not getting quite this material, so um, I really want to go the extra edge for you here. And uh, there you go, online fish. Uh, but that's the example of annular pulleys. Here's a closer up uh, version of that. And so you can see your, your pulleys uh, throughout, just like a fishing rod and how they contribute, uh, especially looking at the FDP and how it may be moving the distal failings uh, right there. It's contributing uh, to that. Okay, so. So now we'll get into some deformities that can happen at the finger. So since we were just talking uh, about the pulleys, what happens if one of the pulleys is damaged or torn or ruptured completely? So you can see in this image you have the A3 pulley. Uh, and what happened there is it, it ruptured and that's going to create this finger to be in this flexed position. Uh, you're getting, and this is a good term to know, a bowstringing effect. So in one of those pools, with the bowstringing, you're going to have a loss of overall function, and then it's going to stay in this flex position. So you might even have a problem with extension of the phalanx because it's in this contracted or shortened position for a prolonged period of time. And to lengthen that tendon after it's been shortened for a prolonged period of time might prove uh, difficult. Uh, so this uh, could occur with inflammation in the space. I'm doing a bad job with my, uh, my mouse right now. Uh, but you get the point. So if you have inflammation in the area and actually it accumulates up here, it can cause that pulley to rupture uh, from just a, a massive localized swelling to the area. Certainly this could be a traumatic thing as well. Let's say you're doing a rock climbing incident. A lot of rock climbers have uh, tears of these uh, pulleys or these tendons. And if there's so much tension across the tendon itself, it could cause run one of these pulleys to rupture. Uh, so that is known as trigger finger. Okay, moving on. Oh, so this next slide looks like, oh, we got the, the cheesy joke slide uh, on the one with the Pope. So this is not going to be good. I'm going to, I'm going to get penalized for this in some way or another. Uh, so I, I guess I should tell some type of religious joke, uh, but I have to make it a good clean one. Let me see here. Uh, okay. So here's one. Uh, how do you make holy water? How do you make holy water? You boil the hell out of it. Ah, <laughs> oh, there we go. Maybe I shouldn't leave you that. Maybe I should give you one more. Uh, what do you call a sleepwalking nun? A Roman Catholic. Get it? Roman? Roman? She's roaming? Okay. Uh, so better move on. So there we go. So that's our segue into talking about what's known as uh, papal hand, or sometimes we call this the benediction sign as well. Uh, so if you look at uh, Pope John Paul II there, you can see how, and you'll, you'll see this in a lot of... Um, even statues of him will have this deformity where the fourth and fifth digits are flexed in that position. Uh, and a lot of people originally thought that he was just blessing. That's the way to, to bless people. Or if you mark the sign of a cross over someone as you're blessing them, to, to keep it in that. And a lot of other, what's interesting is now you look at a lot of priests and, and other people, they, they do this uh, as almost like, like a tribute to um, Pope John Paul. So with that, it is sometimes known as a papal deformity, but is actually related to an ulnar nerve neuropathy. Uh, and there's even a research article, because so, people are curious about this, as to whether it's uh, ulnar or median nerve. So there is some debate about that, uh, but for the most part, uh, we think of ulnar nerve uh, pathology. And there's some history to this as as well okay so we better get off this slide 
Let's talk about another deformity. This is known as the zigzag deformity. Uh, and if you have some geriatric patients or people that you know, you might see this um, basic deformity that looks like that zigzag shape. So it starts basically with the ruptured ligaments here. So you have what could be the ulnar collateral ligament of the first CMC, or actually first, it's the CMC joint. Uh, and if that's ruptured, it's going to cause this joint to glide this way, which is going to cause this one to go this way, and this one to go this way, just like the train. If one of the one of the cars, train cars, is off the track, it's going to cause this zigzag pattern. And so this is what you see. Uh, so at this point, just recognize this deformity as the zigzag deformity, and then this is a good image just to look over if you want to uh, see that. Okay, so this one is similar to the zigzag that we saw before. This is known as clawing. So the clawing deformity, and you can see the clawing that happens uh, at the fingers right there. Uh, it does occur uh, when you have a compressive force exerted across several of the phalanx. And so well, here you get the proximal uh, phalanx that is going to hyperextend, and then the middle and distal phalanx are going to uh, flex over. This also is related to the theme of ulnar nerve damage. So this is something that can also occur due to ulnar nerve uh, damage. And for that reason, because it's ulnar nerve, the index and middle fingers are less affected. Why? Because they have that other nerve that innervates them, the median nerve. So there you go, tying some anatomy into all of this. Another one we're looking at here uh, is called Wartenberg's sign. Uh, extensor digiti minimi, if you look at that right there, and you can see how that pinky finger, or the fifth digit, is abducting uh, slightly. Uh, so that's what characterized Wardenberg's sign. It's abduction of the pinky finger or the fifth uh, finger. Uh, because it's unopposed action, extensor digiti minimi cannot help to control it, bringing it back. So it basically is abducted out in um, that position. So we have a question here, uh, results from weakness uh, or, or compression of which nerve do you think is implicated? We are on the ulnar side of the hand. So which nerve? Well, we have the ulnar nerve. Uh, so let me see. So where, let me put a question here, where might the ulnar nerve typically be compressed. So where might the ulnar nerve typically be compressed? Yes, at the cubital tunnel uh, is an option uh, for that. It could be compressed other places as, as well, uh, but it seems especially common at the cubital tunnel because it is very superficial there, uh, and you have the bony uh, borders there that, that if they have any swelling or anything, it may be compromised right there. Okay, so what is this called? Let me clean up the slide here. So you can see the fingers here. They are going to this side. Which side of the hand? That is the ulnar side again. So ulnar is the side. So we call this ulnar drift. So not Tokyo drift, but ulnar drift is uh, what this is called. And you see a, a more functional picture of this. If uh, a patient is grabbing, let's say this is, it could be parallel bars, it could be a walker, um, it could be an armrest, um, it could be something else along there. Uh, with aging, that repetitive ulnar uh, force um, could cause a gradual uh, disruption or there could be more uh, of a uh, problematic disruption of the RCL 
What is the RCL? That is the radial collateral ligament. And so you can see if that radial collateral ligament were ruptured, that makes the phalanx go into the ulnar direction uh, because the radial collateral ligament is going to prevent motion uh, or lengthening into the ulnar direction, just like the ulnar collateral ligament is going to prevent the phalanx from going radially or towards the thumb side, as we sometimes say. Uh, so this could occur with rheumatoid arthritis. So if you look at a lot of patients with rheumatoid arthritis, this is a common deformity that they will have. And then just two more slides just to look over uh, this information. Uh, you can see some of those nice bursa on the extensor uh, area. So you have your extensor digitorum communis, extensor indices proprius, and extensor digiti minimi. Uh, and uh, here's another representation. So here's pictures of the pulleys and everything. And one thing I like to remember this is you have your pads and you have your dabs. Um, so with this, uh, there is palmar interossei are going to do adduction, whereas dorsal interossei are going to do abduction. So if that helps you to remember that palmar interosseis adduct dorsal and our OCIs abda. So you have your pads and dabs. And so that's the end of this uh, presentation. We'll kick it off in class next, but I feel like I should leave you with maybe one more joke. Is that is that something I should do? Okay, so I'll leave you with this one. Uh, what do they call priests in Germany? They're called German shepherds. <laughs> German shepherds? Shepherd? Flock? Sheep? Okay. Anyway, I'll see you later.